If you want to make money with games, you are going to love this podcast. I have here with me a very special guest, Jake Burkett from Grey Alien Games. Jake has 13 years of experience as an indie game developer. He has published more than 11 commercial games, such as Regent Solitaire and Ancient Enemy. He's not only an experienced developer, but he's also a very experienced with casual games, the market of indie games, and how to make money with small games. So, we are going to realistically talk about how to make games, how to make money with small games. Jake, it's a pleasure to have you here with me today. Thanks, Alfred. Nice to meet you and hello to your viewers. Since your audience is mostly from Brazil, I would like to start from the very beginning. So can you give us a quick introduction about yourself and how and why did you start developing games? Sure. So, yeah, I'm Jake from Grey Alien Games and I started programming when I was nine in the 1980s. Uh, this is the era of the 8-bit home computer, and I had a computer called the Spectrum 48K, uh, and it came with a manual for basic programming. And I learned basic programming because, you know, there wasn't at the internet then, there wasn't a lot to do, and games were expensive, so I taught myself. Uh, then I had a Commodore 64 and taught myself on that, and other machines like the Amiga, and continued to make games as a hobby, actually, for 20 years. And I had a, a business software job for 10 years, but I was making games as my hobby and I realized I really wanted to do that full time. Um, and so I quit the business software and went full time indie in 2005, actually. So, so it's been 16 years um, and started making games as a full time indie. First casual games, then some kind of crossover indie games that I sell on Steam and so on. So we can get into that in the talk, I'm sure. That's nice. So you actually currently 16, you have 16 years of experience as a game developer. That's really nice. So my, my data has says it's 13 years. So yeah, it's been three more years. That's very nice. And uh, some more games, about 13 games now. 13 games. Okay. So not 11, as I said, that's very nice. And uh, so since you said like you, you turned out to be a full-time game developer by some time, what does it really mean to be like a full-time indie game developer? Is it like being a rock star, having millions of downloads such as Minecraft? Are you like a, a kind of notch that uh, from Minecraft or uh, the guy that created Stardew Valley, like Eric Barone? Do, do you sell a lot of merchandise for, uh, about from your games? Your games are played by famous streamers. So was it, is it like, like being you, a full-time indie game developer? Okay, well, I'm definitely not like the people you mentioned there. I think it's easy to hear about the outliers in this industry. So the people who made it big, you know, like Notch or Stardew Valley or Jonathan Blow, various other people. And the reality is they're the sort of top 1% of indies. Okay. And then you've got a sort of um, another group who are professional full-time making games surviving like me, but maybe not rich. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then you've got a whole other bunch that are even struggling to survive um, or that are hobbyist. OK, so for me, you know, I make games full time. One thing that's different from a hobby is when it was a hobby, I could just work on whatever I wanted, have fun doing that. I didn't even need to finish it. I didn't even need to ship it or make money. I didn't need to do accounts. You know, I didn't need to do contracts. I didn't need to even hire people. I could just, you know, do stuff myself. And if, if, if it was bad, it didn't matter really. So when you're full time, you know, some of my time is spent programming and designing games, but a lot of it's spent doing business development, you know, working with other people, um, just, uh, yeah, uh, boring stuff like accounts, like I said. So there's a lot of actual running of a business and that's what mustn't be taken for granted is, it is a business if you want it to generate money for you, for you to survive. And so you have to take that side of things very seriously. And luckily I had experience in that from making business software before. So I was able to translate over to games. I didn't start making games until I was 30. So I had like a decade of experience working in an office and doing that kind of stuff. Um, so, but you know, also I choose my own hours. Uh, I choose, I do choose what I work on, but I have to make sure that it fits 
uh, the market and is going to be a viable product. And that's a whole big conversation. Um, you know, so I have flexibility and I work at home on my own and I hire contractors in to do art and music and stuff like that. So, and I work with my wife and she helps me with the design and writing and all sorts of decisions. And lots of people say they couldn't work with their wife or husband. Fair enough. We managed to do so. Okay. But you know, that's the thing to be careful of. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, you started with a very important point that, uh, like m most indie game, dev game developers are not like notch or yeah they not do not make stardew values they those are outliers and mm -hmm. but i ask that you that question because my uh, the public of Korea jogo normally ask is uh, and like there is a lot of youtube videos and youtubers that sell this dream of you making big like with games and always comparing yourself okay you you can make it the next uh, what if you make the next minecraft like you never know right it's i would say the odds are very very low right and uh, since you said like that your games that you make like are not those big hits can you talk more about your games so yeah sure um so the first game i made was a match three game okay and that was back in 2005 and it was a match three for PC. These days, people assume match threes are all on mobile, but I, I started making games before mobile was a thing, right? Um, mobile games. So I made a match three game because I actually enjoyed playing Bejeweled. I thought this is good and I could probably make something like this, but with a sort of Christmas theme and my own twist on it. And I did that. Um, it didn't do very well, but I learned a lot in the process. Um, and then I made a whole bunch more match three. So I kept the same engine and improved it and made it better and learned more about how to make quality games for that market. And that market was the casual download portals like Big Fish Games, Game House, iWin and so on. And those sites would sell match three games, card games, hidden object games, very specific genres. But you had to have the right quality and the right sort of themes that appealed. And I figured that out. And then it, once I'd figured that out, I knew that if I spent a certain amount of money, I could probably make more money coming out the other side if the game was was good enough. And that's pretty rare in this industry. Like it, it, these days, even on Steam, you, you certainly got no guarantees. Um, so this was perhaps easier to make money in the casual side than than Steam. But not a lot of indies want to do that because they want to make platform games or roguelikes, genres which don't appeal to these sites. But I didn't mind them. You know, after Match 3 games, I made some solitaire games. And again, that was popular with that site. But then I um, branched out into Shadowhand and Ancient Enemy. And those are solitaire games with turn-based combat. And the idea was to try to appeal to the Steam audience. And I did to a certain extent, but, you know, not not a hit level. So, you know, again, I'm rethinking and I've moved into city builders for my latest uh, few games. So I'm always changing and looking at the markets and seeing what worked and didn't work um, as I go along. That's interesting. Like, for example, you said uh, with Shadow Hand and Ancient Enemy, by the way, I, I bought your games, on, uh, I think Ancient en Enemy on pre-order and then the Shadow Hand, I bought it after it was launched. Oh. And Good. both of them, like I played like for four, four hours straight because I found them very, very compelling, compelling, compelling and addicting. Like, uh, how do you take such simple concepts, for example, as match three, which apparently are simple, right? And make them like very addicting at the same time. How did you come with like a solitaire game and made, uh, and added RPG elements on top of it, like such as Shadow Hand and Ancient Hand? So I found them amazing. Okay. Yeah, sure. So the thing with match three is it, it was a good fundamental idea and Bejeweled did it quite well. And um, when I made my own match three engine, one of the things I focused on was the, the game feel, which you hear a lot about with platformers and other such games, but game feel is really important, even in casual games. So I made sure my engine ran at 60 frames per second. And I made sure that the gems moved really smoothly and nicely and felt satisfying to match and that the explosions afterwards were really cool and nice and the way everything fell down was good. I used to play a lot of arcade games back in the day and, uh, you know, in uh, Commodore 64 and Amiga games. And I wanted this arcade feel in my match three games so that they were satisfying to play. And I've played bad ones with low frame rates and bad matching mechanics and, and, you know, and I wanted to make them feel smooth and good. And I think that succeeded. 
And then I th I added on levels because Bejeweled doesn't have levels, right? It just has one level you play over and over and it gets harder. So I wanted to add in levels with a variety of challenges and things you need to do within the levels to beat them and get a higher score and so on. And then you can add in things like a meta game. So my spooky bonus game, you collect objects that you decorate your house with um, for Halloween, uh, except that not only they're not just decorations, the objects are power ups that you then use in the game. So they have a meaning. So it goes beyond a decoration. And as you know, uh, with things like with Regency Solitaire, uh, I did the same thing. I got the card game, the basic card game, and made it feel really smooth and satisfying and fast to play. So it's quite arcade like it's not too much sitting around thinking. And then uh, I added on power ups, which you don't normally get in a in card games. You can blast the cards off and do things, numerous things to help you get an advantage over the randomness of the cards. Right. Uh, and then there's the meta game where you upgrade your ballroom. And the idea for Shadowhand, the turn based combat, came to me in a sort of like epiphany moment one day where um, I was thinking about how I could improve the game and I was thinking about Puzzle Quest which of course is a match three with an RPG combat side of things and I thought how could I make that work with Solitaire and that's when I came up with the idea to have Solitaire drive the combat. It still took a lot of programming and testing and idea you know small ideas that needed to be worked out and as you know with Ancient Enemy I improved that formula by looking at what people liked and didn't like and then I think I've made it's a unique game right there aren't any other turn-based solitaire combats like I've done. Uh, there's one other called Solitarica out there, maybe a few more on the way now, but the way I've done it is is unique. So th that's it really, it's polish in terms of game feel and then new ideas that just come to you about how to make the game more interesting and more in the player's control. And so have things that come out through the mechanics like emergent mechanics can come out through the gameplay and then a meta game or story on top or both. And that's kind of the, the, the model I followed. That's amazing to hear about like basically Shadow Hand and, and, and Ancient and Enemy came from like you having puzzle quest, but then mixing mm -hmm. what you, with what you have from experience, previous experience from solitaire games and then you mix it and match them. Basically that's it, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And since here we are in the subject of uh, game ideas, like when you decided to move forward like when we're developing and finishing a game and a game idea and when to ab abandon a project and an idea and move to something else. Okay, I actually abandoned my first project um, as an indie game developer. I mean, before I went full time, I actually never really finished anything, maybe one or two tiny weekend projects, but it's very easy to get a new idea and move on to the next thing, right? Um, but the one that I abandoned was a platform game which was a Kung Fu platformer where you sort of walked around in a level and you explored and beat people up and found treasure. And it was cool, but I realized that it was going to take too long to finish. I, I had already spent months on it and I thought, actually, it's going to take me a year or more to finish and I need money before then, right? I was going to run out of money. And at the time there was no Steam really or any sites to sell this type of game on. And I realized what was selling in the market was match threes and other games in the casual genre. So that's why I abandoned that game and switched to casual games because they would bring me in money. And as I've said before, I enjoyed those games anyway. It's important to enjoy the game that you're making. Otherwise, you won't fully understand what players enjoy from it. And you won't be able to look at, you know, what one thing I did was I looked at other games and made a list of the bad things and the good things. And I tried to only include the good mm. things. It sounds obvious, right? But you can only do that if you appreciate the genre. If you're like, match free suck, then don't make one. Make something that you enjoy, that you know other people enjoy as well. How true, for example, what if you want to make something that you enjoy? Like, let's say your dream game. But what if it's like the scope is too big? For example, you said like make what you enjoy, but how do you mix them uh, realistically? How to make that, and uh, while also making something that can make money at the same time? Yeah, like something that won't make you go bankrupt and won't make you give up, just like you did with your platform game. But then you mm -hmm. had another thing that you like, such as the match three games. So mm -hmm. how to move forward with that, like? My dream game, but at the same time, it can't be like my next RPG, for example. 
Right. I mean, a lot of people's dream games might be an MMO or some yeah. kind of FPS shooter or something, right? And, you know, I, I like those games too. I, I would say, obviously, don't try to do that because they have giant teams and it's just a really foolish first project. Um, but you might be able to pick some aspect of that game you particularly like. Maybe you like crafting or maybe you like specifically the combat or the exploring. And you might be able to pick that element and, and build a game around you know, one particular element of it. That's what indies can do. They can innovate and create within a smaller scope space. And the other thing just generally is absolutely making sure your first project is a very small project. I, I wouldn't even suggest um, people make uh, try to make a commercial game first. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a hobbyist, I think the first thing you need to do is finish a game, any kind of game, even if it's a weekend or a week or a month and put it out there on itch.io or something like that so that people can play it and it plays from beginning to end and it's got a title screen and it's got a game over state or whatever um, and get practiced at releasing entire games and doing the PR cycle and everything as a hobby in safety, whether you've got another job, you live with your parents or whatever, you do that. Um, and get experienced at it before you start your first project. And then your first project should be small, smaller than you think, because it will always take longer. You say three months and it will take a year, right? You know, so always smaller than you think, get the game out. Your first game maybe won't be that good, you know, but you'll build experience and a fan base. And then you can use, uh, hopefully that engine again, or parts of the code and make a second game and it's speedier and you're more experienced. And, you know, um, the big mistake is to make too big a game the first time. And I see a lot of people do that. Now you do sometimes hear of people like the devs who made Owl Boy and Owl Boy took 10 years, right? And then it came out and did really well. Okay, fine. But actually if you figure out the amount of money they made and split it over 10 years for two of them, maybe it's not so good, you know? Um, and there's a, there's a few games you can hear of that have had that long development and success, but they're rare and, it, and it's a big mistake. And also, how did they sustain themselves for that 10 years? I couldn't do that for, for 10 months, you know, let alone 10 years. So I've got to make money as I go along, right? You, you touched a very important point that's coincidentally it's my last uh, question. In one of your videos, like you show a chart where you show your income per hour for each mm -hmm. game that you develop it. For example, you you just talked about Owl Boy that took 10 years to make and it was a success, but how about covering those 10 years of development, right? Then you showed like Shadow Hand, your game that took uh, individual, at least you said, like it was your best game to date in 2018. It has 15 hours of content, but took you two and a half years but it brought you much less income per hour than all your other games, even, for example, Spook, Spook Bonus and your Christmas themed game. So I yes. think, yeah, I think that's the, the, the question. That's the thing, right? You're going to spend two, two and a half years in a very big and long game, beautiful game. But how do you cover those costs, right? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I track my time per project so that I can at least see which ones paid off more than others. And then I'm realistic about, you know, am I working for a good salary or a terrible salary along the, the way? Because no one's paying me. The customers are buying the game and my money comes from that. Right. So um, and it is a shame that something like Shadowhand, which really is a polished and big game, it sold actually a lot of money overall. But then when you divide that money down per hour is not very much. And so there's a balance to be reached between the size of the game you make and the amount of time you're spending on it and how much you need to be paid. And you need to find some kind of balance. If you make something too quickly, it will be low, so low quality, no one will want to buy it anyway, right? So they, you know, or you could spend something, a lot of time making something huge and you're not, it doesn't work either. So there's a balance in the middle. You've got to find it in the middle. But how do you survive meanwhile? Well, you know, a, a lot of people have maybe have a full-time job and are making games part-time, or you can do both part-time. You can get a part-time job and do game dev part-time. You know, maybe you've saved some money up from before for a job or whatever. I mean, I didn't do that. I should have done that, but I didn't. Or some people have a partner that works. Maybe they're earning money and they're allowed to just make games. Well, hey, you know, brilliant. I'd love that, but that's not been my situation. Um, 
it's easier when you're younger you don't have the responsibilities of maybe a mortgage your kids or you know expensive car or something right so you, you know the best time to experiment is when you're younger and have less responsibilities and less overheads in my opinion um, but you need to make sure you have what's called a runway so a certain amount of months to be able to build your game ship your game and then support your game afterwards and you hope that game will make enough money that you can make the next one but this is not guaranteed so you know ideally you might have a runway for two games or three games which is is getting even more difficult right if you had two year runway maybe you could make one uh, two or three games in that time and get better at it it's very difficult um you know i can't offer a guarantee to anybody um you know you just have to try these things if it means enough to you but certainly there are easier ways to make money if you want to make money you, you can get a job somewhere and get paid a salary you know in computers if you're good enough to make a game the thing that is interesting to me is apart from being my own boss and being creative there's also this very small chance of the notch success or not even that just a good success whereas if you're on a salary you're always just on the salary maybe you get some bonus maybe some stock options who knows but when you're making games, there's always a chance it will go big. Now, that hasn't happened to me in 16 years. I've had some pretty good ones and some lots of good ones. Uh, but I have plenty of friends who that has happened to. So I've seen it happen. And I think maybe mine is around the corner. But if it isn't, it's OK, because I'm enjoying my life making games. So and that's the key thing, really. You're touching on a very interesting point like that. If you have a salary, it's like you are going to have forever that salary or a bit more or a bit less depending on the situation but making games is 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 like an entrepreneurship journey just like any other business because as you said in the beginning it's a business right so mm -hmm. if your business can be sustainable for a long time as a small business but eventually you also may launch a very successful product so yeah that's then you have to balance like the risk you have to take right and uh and then it comes to another point you said, like, if you have a runaway, for example, money for two years, you would rather launch three games or uh, instead of spending all that money, like the, your saved money, for example, family money or wife's money, spouse's money, mm -hmm. trying to make you one big game. So I, I have another phrase to paraphrase that you said in another video, like you would rather roll more dice then when giants die, right? So that's true. that's it, right? <laughs> that is very true. Yeah, I would rather do that because you're going to learn more for, from each game. You know, the releasing a game is what really tests you, not making a game. Making a game is tough, but releasing it is when you find out if customers actually like what you made and they give you feedback and you can improve. Plus, you can reuse your engine. Mm. A lot of indies make the big mistake of making one type of game and then the next game, they completely changed to another one, right? I made seven match threes. And which was my most successful one? The seventh one. It, it was spooky bonus. It made a lot of money. Um, you could call that one a hit for the amount of time I'm, I spent on it. The amount of money it made per hour was very good. Actually, one of my mistakes is I probably should have made a sequel and another sequel and another sequel. But I switched to Solitaire. But that was OK. And that's done OK. And I've reused the engine three times, right? And I'm probably going to be reusing it a fourth and so on times. So too much switching of your own game genre or even the technology behind it. Like if you made one game in uh, um, Unity and then another in Unreal, you're, you're losing that mm. um, previous code you've written and experience. So be very careful. That's uh, so basically in summary output more content and focus more on, on creating more because as as jake said right as you said like you you get expertise on releasing this game then another game and uh, of course you, then if you release three products in two years instead of one this the chance of you you making let's say a small amount of money in each is bigger than trying to get money from a single project that's it right jake so yeah and you'll build up fans and you can even mm -hmm. cross promote your games i do a thing on steam where when people play regency solitaire the title screen has a button that says more games and those people can click on that and see my other games and click on those and buy those so fans of one will buy another one um, and you can even set up a bundle on steam where you have if someone's bought one of your games they can get the other games for 25 percent off or something so then you keep the fans 
with you. And then you can set up a publisher page for your own games. So it, that's more likely to happen if you have several games. OK, and then you have a catalog that just starts making money in the background and then you can put it on other sites and people come to you for deals for various bundles and different things. And, you know, so be careful with those. Those though. some of the bundles are really poor, but some sites are quite good. You know, depends. Yeah, I, I love it. I have everything like you're saying. Like, again, let's just to finish this quite specific question. So launch more games and build experience and that's it. Then you have all the elements that uh, that you were saying, right? The, the audience mm -hmm. and uh, the possibilities of distributing your games in bundles and sales, uh, cross sales, everything. So yeah, this, I think this is the best advice one can, could give for, for in-game developers, right? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is really good. And, uh, well, it, I interrupt you there a moment. Just one of the things is people always come back to, you know, um, but it, you should, spend longer on a game in order to make a hit game that goes big. And it may be true. If you spend longer, maybe you slightly increase your tiny percentage chance of a hit game, but you also increase your chance of it flopping, you losing all your money and you having to quit. So what I've decided is the safer model because I have a family and a house and I'm paying a lot of the bills. Um, I need to make sure that I'm a sustainable business so that my games come out fairly often, make money, um, and I can sustain myself in the longer term. And that's what my GDC talk was all about, was about being a sustainable business. And people were like, oh, well, you'll never make a hit game if you keep making match threes. And I'm going, well, you missed the point. The point is I'm trying to be sustainable and guarantee that I can keep working in games rather than rolling the one big die. And then it rolls a one. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> that's a very awesome analogy. Since we, like, we are talking about making more games, then... Uh, Let's talk a bit, uh, go back about the gems. Uh, the first time I, I heard about you was in your blog in 2009 uh, mm -hmm. from a blog post like, are casual games rec rec recession proof when you talk about exactly about like making games with casual game portals such as Big Fish Games and others. So do you think like it, uh, genre, genre has a, a, an impact on, on how you make games? For example, if you make it, more games in less time do you think the genre is important like uh, or and do you think that's uh, in another question like do you think like casual games are it is still possible to keep releasing casual games for a casual public and still make games with it because you talked about that in 2009 what about now what's the situation to casual games now okay there's two questions there then the, the first one about genre is yeah the thing is to make shorter games certain genres are easier to make sure to games in like if you want to make a complex simulator game that will be difficult in a short period of time um, actually many games take longer than you think anyway but you would have to pick the genre you want to make carefully and some of the casual genres once you had the engine up and running you were able to make them in a shorter time perhaps but most of my games were shorter because i reused the same engine Right. I reuse the same engine. People call it a reskin, which I think is a bit unfair. Like it sounds like you just switched the graphics out, which I did do. But I also changed the design of the power ups and the story. And I always improved and added new things and new ideas to the game each time. So for me, it was like an evolution, I would call it. Right. Um, so, yes, genre is important. Uh, are casual games still successful? Well, this blog post I wrote in 2009, which, if you recall, was a sort of global financial recession um, that happened, but people kept buying video games in that time. And look at what we've had with the pandemic. During the pandemic, people were at home and they kept buying video games. So video games is a sort of cheap entertainment, which isn't going out to restaurants or cinemas or whatever, or going on holiday, your vacation, you know, people can play these games at home. Now with casual games, the market has uh, decreased over time because Mo first off, Facebook became very popular around 2009, 2010. If you recall Farmville, do you remember this game, Farmville and those clicker games? And that became popular and then mobile became popular. So Candy Crush and so on. So a lot of people switched to mobile because they could play Match 3 for free or Solitaire for free. When I say free, I mean free to play, right? So there's always some model trying to either adverts or something trying to make money from you. 
So some of the audience left the casual download sites for PC then, but some of the hardcore people remain and you can still sell Solitaire and Match 3 to those audiences. I publish on Steam some Match 3s and Solitaire games and hidden object games for some friends of mine who didn't want to get into doing Steam themselves, but I knew about Steam. So I publish their games and cross promote them. But I ask them, how's it going on the casual sites? Because I haven't put a game on them since 2015. That was Regency Solitaire. And they said, actually, it's fine. You can still make money from them. Maybe not as much as the golden years, but it's still OK. It's just on a kind of slow decline. Right. And so I'm going to try out that market again next year with a couple more quick games that I think I can make a profit on. And I'm going to try that out again. They won't be notch like they won't be Minecraft like, but they should hopefully make a profit and I can continue a franchise. And I'll let, I can let you know in a year whether that worked or not. Um, because what's happened since I moved from casual across to Steam with Shadowhand and Ancient Enemy is Steam has become more crowded, much more difficult to get your game noticed, much more harder to make sales. The top 1% are still doing great, but other people are struggling. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm trying to make games now, some for Steam and some for the casual audience. So I'm trying to do both and seeing which ones work the best for me. You know, because on Steam, I think you often tend to have to make certain types of genres that are more complicated. So Shadowhand and, and Ancient Enemy had the turn-based combat, and that was complicated. It took a long time to get right and balance and meant the games took longer to develop, right? Simulation games are popular for, on Steam, for example. They take longer. Platform games, I don't think, are a good bet because um, there are so many of them. You hear about the great ones that do really well, but so many don't. And the, what's better really is platform games on console with a controller. I know people play them on PC, but they work better on console for me at least. So you have to be careful what genre you choose and is it busy? And there's no clear answer. You know, it's what you can make technically, what you think the market supports, what you'd enjoy, what you can afford to make. There's many different factors. When you say that you're still planning to do casual games next year and, they, yeah. and then you focus on Steam and casual games, do you still publish at a Big Fish, port, a Big Fish Game Portal? Uh, do you sell to only to your website nowadays? Uh, how, how is your sales process nowadays for casual games? It will be going back to Big Fish Games, Game House, I Win, the various sites which took my games before and saying, hey, it's me, remember me? Do you want my game? And I hope they will accept my game. I have friends there who have contacts who will poke them for me, hopefully, if need be. Um, I think some of those sites aren't accepting many games from new people now. So, uh, and because they only want to evaluate games from developers they trust who already know what they're doing, right? Because in the past, they used to get a lot of games that weren't meeting their quality bar and having to do a lot of projections. So it's easier for them to accept games from established developers, right? So I hope they remember that I'm established. I don't know yet, but we'll send them a good game and they'd be fools not to publish it. So um, so yes, I have, have those contacts. I do sell on my own website, but those sales are very, very small. They used to be more in the past. And a lot of developers I know who sell direct, we call it to the customers from their own website. It's great because you keep 100% of the money or 100% minus a payment provider fee of maybe 5%. But you keep all the money and you have a newsletter. So you own the customer's emails and you can contact them directly, which you can't do through the casual sites nor via Steam. They own the customers. You don't, right? Uh, but most people I know who are selling like that have seen a decrease in direct sales over the last five, 10 years because people were just going to Steam and the casual portals, right? So it's not a big earner selling direct. I like to do it because I feel like I'm a true indie when I have my website selling my own game. Uh, and I like putting games on itch.io, which is, it's, it feels more direct, you know, especially as you can adjust the percentage to whatever you want. I've left it at the default 10%, which I'm happy with. Um, and you, you are in contact with your customers directly through them. So I like that. So itch.io is a kind of middle ground. And I recommend it to try it out and to support it, but it's n it's not a big earner for me either. Now that we talked about casual games and Steam, 
Can we talk about your last game? Like, I don't know if it can be classified like as a casual game or a hardcore game, or is it an in between? It is actually T minus 30, right? With a seed builder. So, how, how did you jump like from solitaire to seed builder while keeping like a, uh, as you said, it's only 30, minute, 30 minutes of gameplay, right? So, how, how to, can you talk about it? That's, I'm very curious about sure. it. Yes. Well, that game was a collaboration with Deja Barn Games, uh, who are based in Boston. And um, I, I know Ichiro from there. And he spoke to me a while ago about collaborating on a game. And they had a game called 20 Minute Metropolis. So it was a 20 minute game where you do a sort of city builder. And it already had a lot of the sort of mechanics in it that we used in T minus 30. But my job was to look at that previous game and improve the mechanics, balance it, add new stuff, um, fix a UI, you know, loads of stuff, really. Um, lots of small details, the sort of thing I'm, I'm good at doing. And so one of the things we did was we added proc gen. So you've got different landscapes and different play playability each time. But I did spend a lot of time um, balancing and testing and tweaking everything, really. But the idea to make it 30 minutes, well, that came from Ichiro because he had 20 minutes and he said, let's make the next one 30 minutes. And I thought, well, in that case, it can't be um, a long city builder that you play for a long time. It needs to have the sort of slightly manic arcade feel or RTS feel. And so I was doing research like StarCraft II and looking at things like that and trying to get the feel of those sort of games into it. You can play it casually and chilled and you just play it with a mouse and it, you don't have to think a whole lot like city builders where you're building up complex systems. So that's quite good. It's casually in that sense. But when you get better at it, you get faster and faster. And some of the players I've seen on YouTube are so fast and are scoring millions of points and they've really optimized the systems. And that's what I wanted from people to replay the game and each time get better at playing it like an arcade game, really. Um, and I think that's what worked. So anyway, it was a collaboration, but I think it was an interesting crossover of casual arcade RTS and city builder flavor. Um, what also was important was we came up with the idea of you're building rockets to save people. And that adds a really clear goal to the player, save as many people by the end of 30 minutes. And that was a sort of flash of genius for the design idea anyway. Yeah, I love it how like you, you took a, a very complex chain like city builder which it can take weeks before like you go you know mm. finish something but then you add like a, a small goal as you said or not a small but a direct goal build a hawk and uh, and leave your earth and and yeah that's it so that's how you like you manage to put it, everything together in short sessions right uh, it follows like your, for, your formula of doing quick sections or sec who are being very sessions while being very addicting as i like to say mm. like your games are very addicting and uh, okay so we talked about uh, your games and the market you mentioned in the beginning like you started with blitz max right and now mm. uh, uh, if i remember correctly or you are using unit so mm. can you talk about uh, your tools and your technical workflow like in, in, uh, you said you also have your own framework. Did those frameworks start from scratch or did you use like an open source foundation, a commercial foundation? So yeah, why also the jump from Blitzmax to Unit? So yeah, let's talk about tools in general. Sure. So Blitzmax is, um, I actually used a language called Blitz on the Amiga in the 90s. And Blitzmax was a PC kind of version of that. And it's an object-oriented language which, which sits on top of C++ libraries. So when it compiles, it's fast and it works well. And it used DirectX 9 and so on. So it was fine for making 2D games, not 3D games. And I used it very effectively. I made my own framework within it. And what I mean by framework was the, the Blitz Max handle drawing sprites um, to playing sounds and file system and stuff like this, low-level stuff. But I still had to write a system that handled particles, UI, um, you know, animated sprites, all sorts of various things that you need in a game. And so I built up what I call a framework to make a game work, save file systems, player profile options, you know, credit screens, everything you could think of in a game. And once I'd made that and shipped a game with that, I was able to reuse that framework each time. 
And even if I change from solitaire, so I match three to solitaire, the framework remained the same, but the gameplay screens changed. OK, so it's quite good to build up some reusable stuff in whatever language you use. Um, I switched to Unity because uh, Blitzmax isn't supported anymore. I mean, there's a sort of open source version of it now, which I could potentially use. But I know that Unity, you know, is cross-platform. We actually released a game on Nintendo Switch recently, for example, at Regency Solitaire. And I know that I could also very easily search on the internet for solutions and find them, though the difficulty with Unity is many of those solutions are 10 years old and don't apply anymore, but you need to find modern solutions. And I know that I could easily hire somebody or work with someone else who knows Unity because it's very popular. Uh, or worst case, if I had to get contract work in because I needed some money, I think I could do that in Unity now, right? So there's a lot of reasons I moved to Unity. However, I'm using Unity less and less in terms of its features, and I'm doing more code. I prefer code, so I prefer writing the stuff in C Sharp that does mostly what I want, and I use Unity more as a rendering engine, to be honest, with cross-platform capability. And, and it's UI. I'm using some basic parts of its UI uh, as well. So that, that's why I've I've made that change. And who knows how long I'll stick with it. But I stuck with Blitz Max for over 10 years. And by then you get pretty good and you build up a framework. So if, if Unity remains stable and good for a while, I can stick with it for a while. Uh, you mentioned like you do the business, especially the programming. Your wife helped you with writing. But... What about the art? Your game have awesome. Your all your games have awesome art. And uh, what about the sounds too? Do you also do those? Because the art is like it's it's beautiful, very beautiful. Especially the uh, sh uh, the shadow the shadow game and the ancient mm -hmm. enemy game. They they have very very beautiful art. So how do you do those? Thanks. Well, we hire in third parties. So we hired in a contractor team in Ukraine for our casual games. Um, and we art direct them. So we do a lot of research and we generate lists of the art that we want and we give them examples. And then when they give us the art, we give them feedback and ask them to fix things if they're not how we want. So we're very much involved in the artistic process, but we don't make the art. Though I sometimes fix and polish the art and tweak things, especially UI. Um, so we do that. And for sound, for most games, I made the sound effects myself. I use freesound.org and I get sounds from there and I modify them in Audacity or whatever and I tweak them and I sometimes use a Fruity Loops to make small changes to things as well. So, however, for Shadowhand, we did work with a, a sound company based in Vancouver um, and they did a really good job because we needed a lot of combat sounds and yells of the players and stuff and it was beyond my scope so we needed to hire somebody to do that. So I always say, you know, hire somebody if you want stuff done better than you can do it yourself. And you need to be honest about how you can do stuff. There's normally always someone that can do a better job. But of course, that costs money. So you have to have a budget for that. But hey, you know, the better games look, the better they sell. I know we can find exceptions, but it's pretty obvious that the way a game looks in a video or screenshots makes people interested in checking out the store page and buying it. And so... That is actually almost more important than the gameplay initially. Gameplay is what keeps people playing the game for longer and telling their friends and so on, right? So, yeah. Now, a question not related to game development. I want you that you talk about a bit of what's your project or your hobby project called? Where is my computer? Like, I follow you on Twitter oh. for a long time. And then from time to time, almost every day, you post like, where's my computer? And then a picture. So <laughs> what's the idea behind that? Oh, the idea is, I guess, you know, I like walking in the countryside. I live in the countryside, not a big city. So we have a lot of scenery around here, woodlands, hills, beaches. And I like to go for walks for health and for my physical health and my brain to get away from the computer. And I think one time I sat down on a, a log somewhere and was just staring into space. And my wife took a picture and I jokingly sort of said, where's my computer gone? Because it looked like I was missing my computer, you know, and I was sitting there. And I didn't know what to do. And so that was quite funny and people liked it. So now I've just started a whole series. And whenever I go on walks, if there's a good opportunity, we take a funny picture of me staring into the distance saying, where's my computer gone? And, and they're quite popular. So that's why it's just a fun thing, I guess, which I turned into a 
a video game called Where's My Computer Gone, which is on itch.io and you run around in a platform game and you look for microchips to, to build a computer. <laughs> Yeah, so basically, since you said like you you, you walk you like to walk, uh, I think we don't need to talk about that right? in the beginning. Where exactly are you currently living? Is it in, like near London, so we can uh, geographically think about like where are you currently? No, it's not li near London. It's about three hours away from London. Depends if you call that near. I don't call it near. It's a long drive or a long train journey. We live in Dorset, which is to the west, the southwest of. London, basically. And it's quite nice. It's fairly, if we were to look out across the sea with a telescope, maybe we could see France, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. your pictures from the, the your series, Where's My Computer, are very beautiful. I even mm -hmm. feel like like going to the same place as you go, because the nature is very beautiful. So, it is uh, very nice, yeah. So, uh, as closing words, like, where, where, if someone wants to follow you, I know you, are, you have an esteem, uh, Steam page, uh, each IO page, so where more can people find you? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter quite often as at Grey Alien. Grey is spelled G-R-E-Y, Grey Alien. And that's because I was an X-Files fan in the 90s. So, you know, I ended up uh, with my handle as Grey Alien. So I'm on Twitter um, and that's the best place, really. We also have a Patreon as well, where we write free articles and sometimes some locked articles and I discuss the industry and what we're doing and so on. So those are the two best places. I've got a YouTube channel. I sometimes put programming videos on or talks. Um, I'm around. You'll see me. Nice. So any closing words or advice? I would say I don't know what the situation is where your viewers are, but as well as trying to make money from games directly, the one thing I wanted to point out is I also try to make use of tax breaks, which I have in the UK, which sounds boring, but we can get small incentives for that in the UK, making video games and try to make use of funding from either government bodies or publishers or other indies. So there are many ways to make money from games, contract work as well, not just making the game yourself. And some I've switched between all of these in order to sustain myself. So you need to just be aware of everything that's out there and choose the best thing for you at that time. Okay. Um, but you know, good luck to everyone. Do your best if you really want to do this, but at the same time, you've got to do this carefully and sensibly and make this sure that you can sustain yourself for a long time. Thanks a lot, Jake, for, for being here. It was very insightful. I love talking with you and yeah, hope to see your next game next year. Thanks Alfred. Pleasure to talk to you. Bye. Bye.